Welcome back. Today we're going to be talking more about functions, certain types of functions, and looking at domains, ranges, and diving a little bit deeper into what we talked about in the last video. So one really nice way to think about functions is as machines. So you have a input that goes into the machine, the machine does something to that input, and then you get something out of that machine, the output. So here we have a doubling machine. So what the doubling machine does is it takes any number that you put into it, and it doubles it, it multiplies it by two. So for example, if we put in one as our input, so x equals one, the output, we double one, so we multiply it by two, is two, right? Two times one, we just multiply by two. And then for negative one, if we put negative one into that doubling machine, it becomes negative two, because we just multiply by two. If we put in zero, we get zero. If we put in negative 4.5, might need to check a calculator, we should get negative nine. And if we put 202, we double that, multiply it by two, we get 404. So now we have some questions to think about with this doubling machine. The first one is, will you always get an answer? If you put something in, are you gonna get something out, essentially? And yes, you will always get an answer. Um, you can always double. There's no number that you can't double. Now you might say, well, zero doesn't double. Well, we still put it in the machine and we still got a number out. So there's an output for this input. And the question is, will we always get just one answer for each X or for each input. And yeah, there's only one way to double something. So when we put in one, we only get two. When we put in 202, we only get out 404. There's no other way to double something. So yes, there will only be just one answer for each X. And then the next question, is there any number that you cannot plug into the machine? Well, this is kind of like the first question. There's, you, there's no number that you can't put into the machine because you can double anything. So the question is, is there any number that you can not plug into the machine? The answer I would say is no, because like I said, it can always double. I'm just gonna draw an arrow there. Refer to that first one. And then the last question is, is there any number that you cannot get out of the machine? Well, let's think about that. We're looking at the outputs now. Is there anything that will, cannot come out of the machine? Now you might be thinking, well, when we double numbers, we get even numbers. So maybe odd numbers we can't get out of the machine, but we can put anything into the machine. So think about negative nine here, that's technically an odd number. All we, just, all we did was plug in a decimal or a number with a decimal part. So we actually can get odd numbers, we can get decimals, we can get negatives, so we can get anything out of this machine. Uh, so the question is, is there any number you cannot get out of the machine? No. And the idea is, if we have a number, we wanna see, can this be an output? you would just essentially divide it by two. You do the inverse, you kind of go backwards and see what do I need to put in, right? If we want to see how do I get negative nine out of this machine, we'll divide it by two and you get negative 4.5. That's what the input would be in order to get that output of negative nine. Um, so let's say every number is double another. So what we would say, and we'll talk more about this, but this machine is actually a function. Going back to the last lesson, a function means that for every input, there's exactly one output. This point or this definition will keep hounding in every video ev throughout the, this uh, semester. So we can get one and only one output for each input. So let's take a look at the next machine. 
This is a squaring machine. So whatever you put into the machine, you square that number, you get something else out. So now for the first input, we have one. So we put one into the machine, the machine squares one. So if we do one squared, well, that's just one. One times one, remember squaring, that's what it means. You just multiply the number with itself. You just get negative, you just get positive one. And then for negative one, if we just do negative one, and we talked about this last time, we're doing the entire number negative one squared. So if you want to just double check this, put it in the calculator, you would have to make sure you put the parentheses around the negative one. And you should get out positive one because negative one times negative one is positive one. And then we just keep doing this. If we square zero, well, that's just zero because zero times zero is zero. Now for negative 4.5, we might have to use a calculator for this, negative 4.5 squared. So that's how we put it in the calculator. Let's check using the Desmos calculator. So remember the Desmos calculator, I will uh, allow you to use on the assessments and I suggest using it for the homeworks. It's a very nice tool. So Desmos, D-E-S-M-O-S, -S, it's free. You can get it on your computer, on the website, you can get it on the app, on your phone, or on your tablet like I have. So here's Desmos for me. And so we're doing negative 4.5 squared. Negative, I can make it bigger. Negative 4.5, and we are squaring it. The squaring button is right here, A to the two. And we get 20.25, we just hit that arrow and it enters it, 20.25. And now while we're here, we might as well do the next one, which is 202 squared. So let's do 202 squared. So we got 40,804. So 20.25, and then we have 40,804. So these are all the outputs of the squaring function for these inputs. So the question is, will you always get an answer? That is, can we always put something in and then get an answer out? Does the machine ever break? And yes, we will always get an answer. Because you can square anything. You can square negative numbers, you can square positive numbers, you can square decimals, you can square fractions, you can square zero, anything can be squared. The next one is asking, will you always get just one answer for each X? And for that one, yes, we will always get just one answer for each X. There's only one way to square a number. Right? If we put in negative 4.5, the only possible answer is 20.25. So yes, we will always get just one answer for X. And then again, is there any number that you cannot plug into the machine? That's sort of a similar question as the first one. And there's not any number that we cannot plug into the machine. We can plug in anything. Uh, so the question is, is there any number that you cannot plug in? No, because of what we set up there. And then the last one, is there any number you cannot get out of the machine? Now let's think about that one. Is there anything that will not come out of the machine? Is there any output or any number that would not be an output? And there actually are lots of numbers that we cannot get out. I suggest pausing right here and thinking about what kind of numbers do we not get out when we square numbers. Hopefully you thought about that for a moment. We cannot get negative numbers out. If you square a negative number, it's going to come out as a positive number. Any number squared will always be positive. So in this case, yes, there are numbers that we cannot get out. Um, negative numbers. Because if you square a negative number, it becomes positive. So the question is, this machine is an example of, this is a function because for every input, there's exactly one and only one output. There's no way that we can get two different outputs in this machine. So this, is, this machine is a 
function. So then the last one is the greater than machine. So we put some number in and then the machine will spit out a number that is bigger than or greater than the one that you gave it. So for example, if you put in the input of one, you can get an output of two. If you put in an input of negative one, you can also get an output of two. Now, this works because two is greater than one, two is also greater than negative one. Now, on that same thought, I suggest pausing here and trying to think of what are possible outputs for each of these, maybe even write them down, the possible outputs, which you would think is an output for each of these next inputs. Now, hopefully you thought about that for a moment. So for x is equal to zero as an input, we can get out, uh, let's mix it up. We could use two, but let's say I don't know, 10. And then for negative 4.5, that's the input. We just need an output to be something greater than negative 4.5. So let's say negative four. And then for 202, we just need an output to be greater than 202, so let's say 1,000. Now, you might have got different outputs than I did when you thought about this on your own. And let's talk about why that is and what that means that we can get different outputs. So the question is, will we always get an answer? And yes, we will always get an answer because numbers are infinite. Numbers go on forever. If you think you thought of the biggest number, you can always find one more number that's bigger than it. So if you say 10 billion, you can just say 10 billion in one. There's always a number bigger. Um, so let's say yes. Uh, always a bigger number. There's always a bigger fish to fry. And the next question, will you always get just one answer for each x? Now this is where we might start to vary from the first two. In fact, we will not always get just one answer for x. There's actually infinitely many answers that we could get for each x. Because for one, as an input, I could say three is the output. I could also say five is the output. There are a ton of numbers that are greater than one. So there are multiple possible outputs for the input of one. Same thing for the input of negative one. There are multiple possible outputs for the input of negative one. We could have said five or seven or 22. So we will not always get just one answer for each X. And the question is, is there any number that you cannot plug into the machine? And this, again, is kind of similar to the first question. There's not a number that we cannot plug into the machine because there's always going to be a bigger number. So kind of what we said on the first one. No, because that guy. The explanation from above. So then it, the last one, is there any number that you cannot get out of the machine? Now think about that one for a moment. Is there any number that cannot be an output? That's asking, is there any number that is not bigger than another number? And no, there's, there's not any number that's not bigger than another number. Any number can be an output because just like we said for the first one, there's always a bigger number. Well, for any number, there's always a smaller number. So if you think of the smallest number you can or the, the least greatest number you can, like negative 10 billion, well, negative 10 billion in one is smaller than that. So there's always a smaller number. Uh, so we would say, is there any number you cannot get out of the machine? No, we can get any number out because always a smaller number. So this machine is actually not a function. Because for every input, there is not 
only one output. In fact, for every input, there's infinitely many outputs. You can get any number out, or you can get infinitely many, many numbers out for each input. So we'll have repeated outputs for any given input. And so we kind of touched on this when we were going over the questions and talking about is this a function, is it not a function? But those first two questions were sort of asking, will you always get an answer? That's sort of about asking if this is a function. And same thing, will you always get just one answer? That's asking, is this a function kind of thing. So these two questions are asking about if the machine is a function. So for each input, is there exactly one output? And then these last two questions that we asked for each one is more about what we're talking about today with a domain and range. It's talking about what can we plug in and what can we get out? And we call those the domain and range respectively. So the domain is the set of values that we can plug into the machine or that we can plug into a function or relation. So the domain is the set of all possible values for the input. So when we're asking, is there any number that you cannot plug into the machine, that's checking to see if there are any restrictions on the inputs or on the domain. So if the answer is, no, is there any number that we cannot plug into the machine? So that means we can plug in anything into the machine or plug in anything into the relation or function. Then the domain is infinite. Or the way we would write that in sort of the math language is in parentheses from negative infinity to positive infinity. So this is talking about this, what we call interval notation and we'll practice it more and more as we go through the semester. And then for the range, that's the set of all possible values for the outputs. It's asking what can you get out of the machine or what can you get out of the, the relation or function? So the question where it says, is there any number that you cannot get out of the machine? If you say no, you can get any number out of the machine, then same thing, the range is infinite. Or we would write it in that interval notation from negative infinity to positive infinity. And so we mentioned this interval notation and one of the, the main things we want to work on is how do we communicate or how do we write what the domain is and what the range is? So it depends on how the relations are structured. So we can have discrete input or outputs. So that's saying we have a finite amount of inputs or a finite amount of outputs. Like you can just list them out. It's not infinitely many or, or infinite like we said above. So this is often represented as tables, ordered pairs, or you can see it as the mappings. Uh, so we identify, we communicate this as uh, a set, which usually a set, use the squiggly lines. I know my squiggly lines are not very good. And you just write a list of the inputs or the outputs, whatever we're talking about, domain or range. And now for continuous or connected values where there's no breaks in the values or the values are very connected, you will often see this as graphs or as equations. We identify it using uh, intervals, which we'll talk about in a moment, or we can define as uh, inequalities. So for the intervals, if you remember, we have parentheses and we can have brackets. Now the brackets and parentheses have different meanings. So parentheses means that you exclude a value and brackets mean you include the value. So these are sort of like from this number to this number, include everything. If you use a parentheses, it means include everything but those 
edge values. If you use brackets, that means include everything, including the edge values. And we'll see some examples of that as we go on. And then inequalities, that's just like less than, greater than. So you can say x is greater than or equal to a, x is less than b, et cetera, et cetera. Now let's look at specific examples of domain and range and how to identify them with our different representations of relations. So for this first example here, these are actually the same relations that we saw on the last video when we talked about is this a function, is it one to one? So for this first one, we want to identify the domain and range. So let's start with the domain. So for the domain, we're just looking at the inputs or the x values, how you, however you want to think about it, inputs, x values, independent values, all kind of the same terms or different terms for the same thing. So here we're looking at the inputs. So we have on this ordered pair, two comma three, the input is two, the output is three. So this is a discrete relation. So we want to write the domain and the range as a set. So we're going to use the squiggly bracket and we just list all the input values. So the first one is two comma three comma five. So we're listing all the inputs, right? The, the first value, the X values, the two, the three, the five and the six. And for a discrete, domain or discrete range, when we just list them out, there doesn't need to be an order to this list. Now this list is coincidentally ordered from least to greatest, but it doesn't need to be that way. And then for the range, we're looking at the output values. So on the first point, on the first ordered pair, the output value is three. So we're, it's discrete, so we're listing it with the squiggly brackets. It's a three. And then the second ordered pair, that output is a four. On the next ordered pair, the output is a six. And then the last ordered pair, the output is two. So just like the first one, we just listed out how we saw them, the output values. Now this one is not in any increasing, decreasing order, and that is totally fine for a discrete set. Now for the graph, this graph is all connected. So we say this graph is continuous or the domain and range are continuous. So we're going to be using either the intervals or the inequalities. And it really just depends on what you're asked to use. We can look at both of them, the intervals and the inequalities. So for the graph, let's list the domain. We're looking at the inputs or the X values. X values, remember, go from left to right. So we want to see how far left does the graph go and how far right does the graph go. So the farthest left the graph goes, let's count one, two, three, four, five, and it's to the left. So we use a negative value, so negative five. And then how far right does the graph go? One, two, three, four, five. So it goes to the right five, so we put a comma. So this is half the battle for listing the domain in interval notation. Always least to greatest, left to right. So from negative five to five, include all those values. Zero is included in there. 1.5 is included in there. The square root of two is included in there. So all of the values in between negative five and five are part of the domain you can use as an input. Now the question is, do we use a parenthesis or bracket on these? Well, because these are closed dots, the other option is an open dot, an open circle. Because it's closed, that means we include that point on the graph. So we include the input of negative five. If we plug in negative five, we can get an output of that case zero. So we use a bracket here because negative five is included. And then same thing on the far right side, five is included here. Now, if we wanted to write this in interval or in inequality notation, we would say, so let's say, or we're going from negative five to positive five. So negative five is less than or equal to X. 
which is less than or equal to positive 5. So you sort of sandwich the x in between these less than or equal to inequality symbols. So if you cover up each of these individually, let's say if we erase this, this is saying negative 5 is less than or equal to x, or x is greater than or equal to negative 5. Yes, that's true. You have all these values where x is greater than or equal to negative 5. And then if we look at on the other side, if we erase the negative 5 part, x is less than or equal to 5. So that's everything to the left of 5. So all the space over here. But when we put them all together, that's saying x is in between these two values, negative 5 and positive 5. So then for the range, it's kind of a similar deal. We just see how low does the graph go. We're looking at the y values or the outputs. How low does the graph go and how high does the graph go? A common mistake that people make when looking at the range, if you already said what the domain is, you see, okay, on the far left, it goes down to zero, and on the far right, it goes up to, what is that, one, two, three, three. Oh, so the range is zero to three. But what we're looking at is how low does the graph go? What's the lowest point? We're not looking left or right at all. We're just looking how low up and down. So the lowest it goes is zero. The highest it goes is all the way up to, let's count one, two, three, four, five. This point right here is the highest point on the graph. So it goes from zero to five. And both of those are closed dots, so we use brackets. Or we could type, write it in inequality notation, zero is less than or equal to x, which is less than or equal to five. So then for the mapping diagram, this is again a discrete relationship, just like the first one where it's just a list of ordered pairs. This is also a discrete relationship where it's just listing out the mapping from three to one, from five to two, etc. So the domain here, I'm just gonna abbreviate with D, is we're looking at the beginnings of all the arrows. Remember on the left hand side here, this is the x values, and on the right hand side here, these are the y values. Or x values are domain, or x values are the independent, or the x values are the inputs, all the same thing. So we just list out, because it's discrete, it's just a list, There's, it's not connected, it's not continuous. We just say from three to five, and just for fun, I'm gonna mix it up and say nine and seven. And this is still correct, even if we did seven and then nine, the order doesn't matter on a list like this where it's discrete. And then for the range, we just list out the outputs. So we have one and two and three. Now sometimes in the homework systems, because this three is sort of repeated, it goes, it gets mapped to from the seven and from the nine. You may or may not have to rewrite the three. Just make sure to, to look at the hints or the suggestion on the homework system to see do I repeat the three or do I leave it the same? In my philosophy, I say you leave it the same. Now let's look at some more examples of domain and range. I suggest pausing here and trying to figure out what the domain and ranges are for each of these relations on your own. So hopefully now that you thought about some of these for a little bit, let's take a look at this first one. Negative four x squared plus seven. Okay, so we have to think, what kind of numbers can we plug in? Well, what's happening to the inputs, your first, remember, order of operation, you're squaring, and then you're multiplying by a negative number, and then you're adding by seven. So nothing in that process will break or will go wrong in the world of math no matter what you plug in. You can plug in negative numbers, you can plug in fractions, you can plug in zero, you can plug in positive numbers. You can always do these operations to those numbers. So the domain here is infinite, or we would say from negative infinity to positive infinity. And for negative infinity and positive infinity, if, if that's part of your domain or range or your interval, you always write the parentheses. Never use the brackets on the 
infinities because you can never actually include or reach the infinities. It's more like an idea rather than uh, a definite number. And then for the range, this one we have to think about a little bit more. What kind of numbers can we get out of this? Well, let's try plugging in some numbers and seeing what happens. So if we do x is 0, it's a good starting point. If we plug in 0, this is going to end up being y is 7. Because you plug in 0 into the x, you get negative 4 times 0, and that's all 0. But then you just get 7 out. So then if we plug in, well, let's try something else. Let's maybe do 10. And I'm sort of just picking these numbers. I'm seeing what happens when you pick a bigger number, when you pick a smaller number kind of thing, and seeing how the outputs behave. So if we plug in 10, then the output we get, so we might have to do a little work here, negative 4 times 10 squared plus 7. Well, this is 100. 10 squared is 100 times negative 4. This is negative 400 plus 7. That gives us negative 393. So that's the y. Okay, that's a very negative number. Let's just try one more and see sort of what the pattern is here. If we plug in an even bigger number, let's say 100, I'm just picking these 10 and 100 because they're easy numbers to work with. So if we choose 100, so we have y is equal to negative 4 times 100 squared plus 7. Now 100 squared is, we have to you know add two zeros onto this because we're multiplying by a multiple of 10. So this is negative 4 and then 1, 2, 3, 4 zeros. So that's negative 40,000 plus 7. Well, this is going to be a very negative number. So it can be negative 39,993 is the output. So we can see as we plug in bigger and bigger numbers, and this will happen too if we plug in more and more negative numbers, we're actually going to get the same outputs because we're squaring the number. It just becomes positive anyways. The outputs here are getting more and more negative. The smallest number we can actually get is 7 as an output. And we'll talk more about when we get into the specific types of functions, how to identify these domains and range. But this one is actually the lowest, it, or the, the highest it goes is 7, and the lowest it goes, it'll just continue to get more and more negative. So it'll go all the way down to negative infinity. And then the highest it will go is positive 7. And we can actually get that output of 7. We just did, you know, plug in, set, plug in 0, and you get 7 out. So we include 7. We use a bracket. So with the equations, it's a little bit more work, you can see. But that's a big part of this course, is to look at different types of equations, different types of functions, and see how do we find domain and range of the functions? How do we find all these different aspects or characteristics of this function. And that is essentially the main scope of this course, is looking at how do we identify all of these properties of all these different functions. We're just building up this huge toolkit of different functions. So now let's take a look at the next one. So we want to go from the farthest left, if we're looking at domain, the farthest left to the farthest right. So the farthest left it goes is 1, 2, 3, 4, and that's negative. So negative 4 all the way up to how far right does it go? 1, 2, 3, 4. That's also 4. So it goes from negative 4 to positive 4. And we use brackets because we actually include these points in our graph. They're closed. And then for the range, how low does the graph go? Well, this is the lowest point here. 1, 2, 3, that's negative 3. And how high does it go? 1, 2, 3, oh, well, that's positive 3. And it's closed points. They're filled in. They're not open. So we use brackets. We include them. Now for the mapping one, this is going to be a discrete one, not continuous. So we're going to use the squiggly brackets, the set brackets.
So we have our inputs or our x values are 0, 5, 2, 7, and negative 3. And close it with the squiggly brackets. And the range are what we see on the right side. What is everything getting mapped to? So this is squiggly bracket 8, 6, 5, 4. So that's how we identify domain and range for these different representations. However, these relations or these functions, most some of them are, are sort of just in a vacuum of space. We're just talking about these in kind of a blank context. But sometimes and oftentimes, functions or relations are defined in a given context to describe something in the world. So for example, if we have this equation of this function that we just talked about, this negative 4x squared plus 7, this could be a function where x represents the time since a rocket was launched. So in this case, the domain would actually be restricted. Earlier we said the domain was negative infinity to positive infinity. And you could make some arguments for what the domain would be now that we're in this context. However, let's just say we're only looking at the time after the rocket was launched. So the domain, we can't really have negative numbers because we don't have negative time. So we can only go forward in time. So the domain here would be zero seconds, and you can include zero seconds, all the way up to, well, technically this would go to infinity because time is infinite, depending on who you ask. And so this would be the domain in this context because time is not negative. And I'm sure you can make some philosophical arguments against that, but for our purposes, we'll just say time is, I wouldn't say positive because zero technically isn't positive, so we say time is not negative.